Okay. This is the international, intercommunalist convergence. And intercommunalist means as it does, you know, in the thesis of Dr. Hewitt B. Newton, that uh, we are talking about a, the communalization of society rather than having a state dictating and controlling and manipulating. We have people actually organizing themselves into their own communities with direct democracy. And that's what we're about because each formation has its own specific characteristics which remain autonomous and uh, preserve their own identity like the Jewish Socialist Bund does in the Convergence. And we are in different uh, locales in the world, in different countries, and we bring each of our identities to bear without sacrificing anything that we have to contribute from our own particular cultures and political cultures. So this is how we work in this United Front, as it says in the background here. And we will take, you know, uh, turns to report on what our, each of our areas of work is uh, concerned with. Yes, Kara. That also comes into like a big example of like, or the great, the greater like dynamics of intercommunalism and how communities are um, interrelated and intermingle is that there's also cultural crossover because like there's there's both two Jewish people and two Celtic people in this room even though there's only three people in the room. Mm. Yeah. So it gets into that like dynamic of how we like also intermingle, interconnect and interconstruct relations with each other. How culture is not this like border, like, you know, like a Chinese wall. It's more of a, like a, like a plasmatic fluid where it is, it, it's something that can stay quite strictly separate from the things it's around, but not really. Like it's intermingling, it's blobbing in, but it has its own distinction. You know, blood doesn't stop being blood the moment you put it in water, but it definitely mixes in with the water. If you combine blood with other plasmatic fluids, eventually they will blend as well, but their ability to stay um, stable as they develop new greater heights of uh, development is that sort of like intrinsic facet, you know, culture isn't the same thing it was a thousand years ago. Like the English, weirdly enough, they have actually changed. I know, I know it's surprising, uh, but they have actually changed over a long time. So it's like um, that sort of like great dynamic of how we blend together as mm. well as having uh, distinctions. There, mm. um, the the yeah. lines of demarcation drawn by borders need to be completely disintegrated because they stop culture from properly going through this process or at least mm. they slow it down and they uh, create a situation where it is that case where people do believe that it is strictly barred off that there is this strict distinction between like um, uh, uh, like cultures in a sense where like there is no blending you know an Englishman's always an Englishman an Arab's always an Arab and it's like Okay, technically that is true, but technically it also isn't because those people have exchanged culture. And Islam, Islam will tell you this more than anyone. Islam very strictly states that if they find culture that they think is low key better, they're going to take it on. Like that's like a big part of Islamic development that people tend to miss out. And Muslims will tell you it to the high heavens. They respect the culture of other lands as well, even if they don't necessarily want to take it on. Hmm. But they also, if they find culture that they're like, mm -mm, that's going to do good for my people, they're going to take it on. They're going to learn from it. They're going to develop it. Yeah. Um, it's part of the radical spirit of Islam. Mm -hmm. This is the diasporic uh, nature of the Jewish people because Jewish people have always sought to go to the most interesting places like Vienna, Odessa, Warsaw, and now New York. Okay, so... And uh, that the dual God, it, it, identity it fucking, that's like, developed off at the end there, like it was like loads of really like cool places, <laughs> like, and then like, just like genocide. Classic, brilliant places until we get to, you know, New York, and then all we have is the Benny Goodman band. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anything better that's come out since then. That's been a long time. To be okay. fair, though, the Jewish people of New York are the reason why New York is interesting. Like the comic industry and stuff like that was basically well, like you know, powered by Jewish writers. What, Andrew? As well as the sandwich shops, too, I'd say. Oh, 
Yes. <laughs> God damn. Like the famous sandwiches, world famous sandwiches. And like a lot of Americans don't know that they were crafted for, from Jewish culture. Ah, uh -huh. And pickles, pickles too, you know, like it's very important. Yeah, that's a thing. Okay, now, so this uh, dual identity that, uh, that uh, you carry as well, both uh, Celtic and uh, English backgrounds, uh, and that uh, we carry. Fortunately. Yeah. Um, it, it can uh, build bridges. <laughs> as, as you mentioned, it creates this uh, a dialectic, you know, that uh, produces uh, new ideas that didn't exist before because there's an intermingling of cultures that uh, that merge into something new and different. In fact, that's the whole nature of the appeal of American pop culture, you know, because it has created so much new stuff because of the fusion of uh, various other cultures, in particular, black culture. But... Uh, Nonetheless, because the you know, America has been a success in that in that fashion, you know, in terms of its cultural contribution to humanity. But besides it, that, it little has else, little else. But it, it has, but it also has done so in a toxic way, because uh, as you say, it's like predominantly comes from the black community, and yeah. like America kind of latched on to taking advantage of like black community developments and things. Like, how many genres can you think of that were invented by white people? Um, so like huh. some people might say punk. Well, they're wrong. Like punk isn't <laughs> even a genre, just to be clear. But if uh -huh. we're gonna go on about who is who was the first punk band to do punk rock. It was uh -huh. Death, which was a three-man black punk band that predated the Ramones. But uh -huh. no one talks about them. They always go on about the Ramones. And the Ramones were they, they were crappy punks, given one of them was a fucking Republican. But the, uh -huh. um, what's it? Uh, you know, um, what, people are going to mention jazz? Jazz actually comes from House Slaves and their version of blues, which was, like, um, pushed to be more complex to satisfy the interests of the bourgeois, like, dining rooms and stuff like that and so like when they were like uh the fully emancipated because actually house slavery took longer to be ended uh because there wasn't actually any like constitutional position put in place that said you can't have an indentured servant because this is the thing if it's an indentured servant it's technically was there was still some loopholes to make it legal especially in places like texas um, hmm. That ended, I, it was either the uh, 1880s or 1890s, I can't remember. There was a black politician that pushed for um, uh, the Constitution to be amended um, to solve the problem. Because basically black people were still not actually classified as people or human beings in the Constitution. They were just hmm. freed from chattel. And so um, that was one of the major loopholes that was allowing for the continuation of indentured servitude and holding people as house slaves. Um, um weren't there a lot so of like, irish who were indentured servants oh yeah absolutely especially in the caribbean um mm -hmm. which is why that they are like pasty white looking people that speak a, the exact same patois without a without a beat of difference to the jamaican population because of the mm -hmm. irish indentured servants and yeah. there's like a lot of solidarity between these groups usually there yeah. are also problems because where there's the mm -hmm. irish and settler colonies there's, there's the West Brits. Uh, they do appear to. Um, but I will say um, that sort of situation with jazz, what was it like the 20s? People talk about jazz as invention and like not actually. It was the 1800s, but it did get into like normal, like, like listenage, like lexicon of usage in the 1920s because um well it was a mix of white and black artists but it was because of the white artists that were starting to like uh appropriate it you okay, know like being okay. crosby is who okay, people that's think of they... okay that's history okay so, but think we're of, like r&b okay so well i mean it's not history andrew, political andrew what were you trying to inject there oh no your microphone is not working you're not close enough i think hello yeah that's better you know stay close you know anything Oh boy, your, uh, your audio is quality really is just poor. gone. Yeah, Lex, your microphone is not plugged in all the way, or or it's dying. But the um the point I was making Still is that like you. society is um uh like yeah. society in America hinge pins on this kind of like 
savage theft of culture that you see all throughout its history. And so, like, the way its multiculturalism has kind of worked has been at the expense of the most oppressed cultures within that culture. Not all the time, though. Proletarian intercultural and intercommunal relations have mm. been hella positive in a different direction. Yeah, much closer, um, because, because if you're working side by side every day, you know, with somebody from a different culture, you know, you're going to get to know that culture, you know, eventually. Wait, Whereas the petty bourgeoisie like, like being on the you know, streets with, their own with kind. them. It's the What's same that? as being on the streets with them homeless, like side by side as well. So you oh, see yeah. like a lot of like the underground culture around things like punk and hip hop. They have tried to take a more like explicitly like anti-racist, like pro-black statement against the, the situation of society that has mm -hmm. been a counter culture against the U.S. Uh, multicultural theft shit. Yeah. OK, I'll Andrew, be... give it a try. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's yes. good. So about early rock and roll, Elvis, for instance, stole plenty of songs from people of color. Uh -huh. He yeah. stole his singing style from black people as well. Like Elvis. Yeah, <laughs> Elvis yeah the sort of hermit, oh, sort of like throatiness. Like that is Southern, like, uh, like uh, New African style of like singing sort of things. Like that's that soul kind of voice that is. Like, yeah. so, you know, guy was stealing literally the soul of rock and roll, motherfucker. Mm. Yeah. And the real classic uh, black singers like John Lee Hooker are sort of, you know, not known. <laughs> it's really, yeah. 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 He has like the white thing as well of like, um, like trying, like interpreting, like the way black people sing and express their culture, but doing it low key bad. Like you compare him uh -huh. to any of the fucking like black blues and like uh fucking um like uh what's it um uh rock and roll artists that were around at the time yeah um i can't believe i forgot the word rock and roll in a conversation about elvis they obliterate the floor with elvis like yeah. fuck yeah. Yeah, elvis yeah, yeah. is like so overrated yeah elvis that's right but write, elvis didn't even write blue suede shoes for that matter. <laughs> yeah that's right yeah, I know that even. Yeah. But, you know, uh, mm -hmm. another singer, a Jewish singer, Amy Winehouse, I think she advances uh, the black blues tradition. I think that she is innovative. You know, I think that she flows into the stream there and that she's There's not. There's a tragedy like, uh, the way she died. Yeah. Alcohol poisoning. Yeah. Out of boredom, probably. Yeah. I didn't even know if she was Jewish. That's how suppressed her heritage is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, I have a collection of her wearing a Jewish star of her photos. I've almost yeah. had alcohol poisoning plenty of times, and it's not fun whatsoever. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. It's poison, basically. You know. Yeah, my like my medicine literally is the nerve suppressant. Like, okay, now then, let's hear hear from uh, United He's States of America. Okay, Andrew, what's going on in in the in the in the Imperial Center? Yankistan. In the Imperial Corps. Well, Yankistan. one of many things that the other day I saw an anarchist symbol right next to a Trump logo. <laughs> really? <laughs> this is really yeah. well educated, you know, culture you have there. <laughs> oh wow. That's I a know. wild one. <laughs> I mean, I mean, we're talking about the country that managed to pervert a, a libertarianism, a term that literally just means the left. Marx literally was the guy who coined the term libertarian socialist. Like, mm. you know, uh, because Marx said it explicitly expressed the balance between like um, the the freedom and like the protecting of the right of people to be free, as well as yeah. the need for people to be dedicated to the community and to society. And yeah. so like that balanced relationship in that sort of thing was an important part of Marx relating it to the French Revolution, which is where the term libertarian comes from, from the libertari. Uh -huh. You know, um, which is like, you know, you might modern day hear the word liberty translated from it, you know, <laughs> but the, yeah. you know, it's a lot of Latin, like, um, espousement for the bourgeoisie's supposed end of feudalism's oppressive taxes and stuff like that. I, I'm sure they did they get rid of taxes. So America, the most capitalist country on the world, trademark. Did they get rid of taxes? Are they, are they all? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Well, the American well, Libertarians. I, I they saw can't do it. Literally, they, they like their services, the whole state relies on it. So they keep trying to do it. And it's like capitalism doesn't provide an alternative where the bourgeoisie pay their, their due. Because the only way you could get rid of it is the bourgeoisie have to pay their fucking way. You have to take money off them. You have to still have a tax for the big guys. Um, but they, they literally would never do that. And so instead, they're just going to like remove tax for the big guys and keep tax on you because they know getting rid of tax completely is suicide for capitalism. It will die if it does so, but it could live if it still taxes the shit out of us. Uh, yeah. Well, okay. Now, so, okay. Now, in terms of the uh, American political scene, we know that uh, that Harris is uh, is no savior, right? <laughs> That uh, Camila Harris is just, you know, like a carbon copy of Biden with some touch up makeup in order to make her see, seem uh, sort of, you know, more uh, in the times, you know, because Biden got caught between a Zionism and between a genocide that he was accused of supporting, which he did support. So now Camila Harris is coming into the scene here now. And she's no better, but, you know, she says some things and she did boycott the Netanyahu speech, you know, makes her look a little bit better, but. I don't think she is, you know. So it's uh, still uh, this morning. I couldn't hear you. Please come closer posted, to the mic. I posted about that this morning and said that her so-called con condemnation of Netanyahu is nothing more than performative politics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was just talking to him because I needed to perform. I cannot stand on my own two feet as the leader of the most powerful country in the world and say no to one of my colonial compradors. I just cannot do it. No, not possible. I must code switch and become a Zionist. That's what's happening. I promise. I'm not code switching to you right now. I swear this is honest. Like, goddamn, Kamala Harris is like doing double time back on herself of forgetting that she was the, the fucking vice president and just followed along the president. No member of government works for the president. They work for the government. If she had some principled problem with the president's fucking Zionism, she could have spoke out against it when a genocide that has been estimated to toll up to 189,000 Palestinians died. Sure. Not 40,000, 180 fucking nine. Oh, no way. And that was, no I, I heard that That's earlier this week, so it could be up in like another 10,000 at this rate. That's a Lancet uh, estimation. That includes, uh, I think that includes the likely number of people who are going to be starving to death. And oh, that's the, the disease. Yeah, that's, uh, it's inevitable that they're going to be dying. So that's why I there, there's so many people out in the desert. Like not everyone made it down south. A lot of people ended up straight up in the desert. Oh, they're like, trying uh, to like, drive the Palestinians crazy and, and wanting to leave, you know, go anywhere in the world, you know, but gas. They're trying to depopulate the whole area by this kind of torture. Yeah. Because torture. those that don't know, a big chunk of Gaza is straight up desert. Like yeah. the only way that you could support building something up there out in those deserts is by having Israeli funds. And so some mm -hmm. of the roads that go through those deserts mm -hmm. have been destroyed. And there's some of the only ways to cross um, through those areas safely because you're in a desert, you'll get lost. You can't mm. fucking locate yourself. In, like um, in a desert, they tend to be like really, really hard to direct yourself somewhere if you're not in a car and on a road. Like they're really hard to fucking uh, navigate. That's the word I was looking for. Sorry. Um, so, like, you know, what they'll do is they'll build a settlement that's out in those areas that needs all of this support because you literally can't be out in these kind of places without having a, like support from a more constructed area that can like produce the excess materials that you can't produce because you're not in an area to be there until you can build the facilities like um, like water developments and stuff like that that can allow you to transform the desert because we got some pretty fucking dope technology for making um, areas in remote places much more livable um so like you know what they'll do then is they'll build a massive highway they'll mm. run straight over that road cuts the road off there's mm. no way around except a five-hour detour mm. all the way around 
Mm, yeah. And yeah. they're doing this all over Gaza. They're doing this all over Gaza. And like, mm. so all the roads are getting chopped up and it can take like five, six hours to get to the nearest hospital. If you can Absolutely. get through the checkpoint. Yeah, Andrew. If Come you can get through the, the checkpoint, because they'll probably hold you for another two, three hours if they know that yeah, you've yeah, got yeah, someone yeah. dying in the car. Of course. That's like the West Bank. I also heard the Yemen. Okay, come closer. I also heard the Yemen attack Tel Aviv. Oh, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tel Aviv got hit uh, with a with a, a new kind of drone, you know, from the from the sea. They maneuvered, oh, you know, the shit. drones yeah, coming no, off I was... the sea. Yeah. I was on about, um, I got confused. Yeah, no, I was actually on about the West Bank. Sorry, my bad. Um, yeah, no, the, that was from the West Bank because they were building those settlements and they were blocking the, um, I got confused with something else. No, no but they're doing that in, in the Gaza too because they build the, uh, yeah. they build roads that go from east to west and not north south. And so they cut Gaza right in half already, you know, and that's, you know, it's like they, they've made two Gazas now, you know, because that, that road in the middle is a militarized road that doesn't allow any passageway, you know, to the north or to the south, you know. So oh yeah, when they build over the roads as well, they don't just facilitate some sort of underpass either. They just put concrete bullets in the way, like um roadblocks. I've seen them in the West Bank, you know, where they have an underpass, you know, but they can shut down the underpass anytime, you know. So it's it's like prison, very much like prison. Big prison. Okay. Now in Canada, what's happened this week? You know, one good thing. The Zionist charity called the Jewish National Fund has been deregistered by the uh, Canada Revenue Agency. We've been trying to do this, you know, like for 30 years or so. We've been complaining, you know, to the Canadian government revenue agency that this is a front group, you know, for Zionists to collect money, you know, for military purposes and for making uh, use of occupied territories like Canada Park near Jerusalem, which I went to visit. And... You know, kind of the revenue agency, you know, just deregistered just like that, you know, <laughs> freaked them out completely. You know, the Zionists had no idea that this was possible. You know, they thought that they had already passed five, you know, um, uh, what I mean, audits and they, and, and they were approved, you know, and they never had any trouble. But all of a sudden things have changed, you know, so now they realize, you know, that that the protest movement is forcing a political change upon the government. It's not the government that decided to do this because they've been stalling on dealing with the Jewish National Funds, you know, for, for decades. Now they have to do something because they couldn't allow monies to go with, you know, exemption from taxable income here in Canada, which gives, you know, like a certain percentage of, uh, of public funds, in effect, you know, as a donation so subsidy, you know, to the Zionist state there. Well, that's cut off now. And there was another one that was cut off, you know, uh, a couple of years ago that was even worse. So <laughs> they they have, you know, just a, a few petty, you know, like charitable organizations that are affiliated with particular uh, religious or political tendencies now, but they don't have any central apparatus now for collecting funds, except for the combined Jewish appeal in which they go and they uh, uh, basically tax all, you know, members of the Jewish community who can be taxed. And 35% uh, of that is sent uh, to the Zionist state to make up for the lack of funding for social services in, in, the, in the civil society there. So, uh, you know, this is a big victory. You know, it's un unprecedented and unforeseen as well. So there's something happening that, you know, we haven't even been responsible for. That is a consequence of the protests as a general phenomenon. This is having an effect. Yes, Andrew, please come closer to the microphone. Yeah. So uh, last night when I woke up at around 4.30 this morning, I saw a commercial for a corporate, not a corporation, a charity, a so-called charity called the Christian Jewish Association that supports the Zionist regime in the Middle East. And they said that Israel is under attack. Oh, Oh, I see. Well, it's like uh, I saw someone with like um a Israeli flag in their like fucking name, and it was like, what's like um more like progressive or like like uh or something like that, and it was like a Western Judeo Christianity or extremist Islam, and like uh, obviously it's extremist Islam. Let's get it. <laughs> Let's get it straight. <laughs> Three guesses. They didn't define which kind of extremists. They never said whether it was going to be the socialists. They also get called extremists. 
Yeah. Make yeah. quite a little fucker I can if you're gonna fucking throw like buzzwords at me. Like yeah. what, what, what do you mean? Because like it's not saying a fundamentalist, because that's like that's a type of extremist, but there's also yeah. like uh communists that are fucking Islamic, like um what's it, you know, um a, a lot of the communist parties in Palestine are actually like the membership is made up of Christians and Muslims and uh, all sorts of different people, atheists as well, of course. Where there's Marxism, there's atheism. Um, yeah. <laughs> and this thing, you know, that uh, the commercial, you know, refers to of Judeo Christianity. This is what the <laughs> Trump, you know, like it doesn't exist. First of all, and 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 secondly, you know, like um, Trump refers to the one country, one nation, and one faith. That's what he said. You know, it is except one nation under Islam. <laughs> 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 one faith what faith is he talking about he's talking about christianity for sure but you know if he's challenged you know on on that you know point you know he'll probably say well he's referring to judeo christianity you know that's how they get out of it you know like that's how they get out of you know like a theocratic you know state is what they are but they deny it you know by saying oh well it's not a theocratic state because it's not one religion you know it's a judeo christianity which is not one religion it's two you know, but, the but it's one at the same time, you know, <laughs> so it's, you know, like it's one faith, you know, but it's two, you know, like, so, you know, where's that going? You know, I don't know, you know, like, like, oh boy, you know, like what a mess. Judeo-Christianity is just like a, one of the most toxic bourgeois business relationships and partnerships I've ever seen in my life. Because that's yeah. what it is, <laughs> a cooperation between the religions. No, um, a business partnership between the evangelicals and the Zionists. Yeah, basically. I mean, Judeo-Christianity actually predates Zionism, but the, the guys that were like the proto-Zionists in America uh, were like actually big fans of this Judeo-Christian like bullshit that they started to cook up because it actually comes from some weird Anglo shit that's just like half-baked nonsense. Oh, um, we also have in, like uh... the British thinking that there's they're fucking Israelis, like oh, that yeah, they were yeah, like yeah, 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 that's British Zionism, from. which predates yeah. Zionism, which is the fucking hilarious thing uh, uh, I've ever that heard. Me, actually. Come closer. That reminds me because I was in a church when I was younger with my grandparents who consider themselves British Israelists. Oh. And they, they considered that Anglo Saxons were the real Jews. Oh, really? Well, what oh. the uh, original idea was was that the Anglo Saxons um, were the missing 13th tribe of Israel. Yes. Oh, 12 tribes, yeah. Oh, the missing 13th. Oh, now there's a 13th. Yeah, tribe. yeah, they made one up. Oh, there's they made one up. Oh, I get it. Tribe. What's they that? Said there's a 13th, they said there's a 13th tribe. Yes. No, you have to sit up and you have to stay sitting up. You know, come closer. No they leaning back. There's you know? a 13th tribe. Uh huh. Really? So this is a. How, how did you. Uh, this is your grandparents who were into this? Yes. There's this weird church called the united church of god and uh i was a part of it growing up and it's pretty much protestantism uh -huh. mixed up with british israelism uh -huh. but they were jewish originally then i take it my grandfather was jewish yes oh i see so but uh, he assimilated by and preserved his identity by calling himself an israelite a british israelite okay i get it okay yes. Non is non assimilated assimilationism. Okay, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, really. Wow. Colonialism wow. brings some fucking absolute insanity to the table. Like, why do people even allow the British to exist? Is my question on this. Like, <laughs> they, they, you know, uh, not to not to be getting uh, like uh, not to be turning this into an Irish forum or something, but we've been petitioning for like eight hundred years or so now to fucking get like something done about this, and Britain mm. still has an empire. Like, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, 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 yes. Yeah. Yeah, so... We got to look to our own failures in that regard because we aren't even a free country, but like we're trying. Okay. <laughs> yes. 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 Uh, I... I'm uh, I'm obliged to uh, express my fidelity and subservience to King Charles the Third. Yes, uh -huh. my king, my king. Yes, King Charlemagne the Third. Yes, uh huh. 
That's what Charles is short for. Charles is short for Charlemagne. Uh, so th- th- is that a consequence of the, uh, what is it, the Norman invasion or something like that? Yeah, I think so. Um, uh, Maybe it was a common it? king over both France and England at the time or something like that. I may be mistaken, but wasn't Charlemagne king of the Holy Roman Empire? Um, yes. Yes, the, but I don't the think the name Crusade originates was... with him. Uh, but the oh. first the, the first crusade came out of France. The second crusade came out of Germany, then England. Yeah. Explaining to people that the Holy Roman Empire was the first Reich of the German Empire and confusing the living shit out of them because it has nothing to do with Rome. Uh, other than it being Roman. <laughs> it's like, goddamn. Because I guess it doesn't stand out too much to them with the British for some reason. I don't know how. They literally use Roman stuff all the time and espouse themselves as it. Because it's like you get to like the 1850s and then they're like, now we're New Rome. You get the Germans and they're just like straight at it. Like they're, they're not even going to like beat around the bush. We're the Holy Roman Empire. We're not just the Roman Empire. We're its holy cousin. Um, we're not like those dirty people. <laughs> pagans is like their approach to it and it's like oh god damn anti-paganism this isn't fucking new to my fucking people god damn you know like um it's always tends to be the default with a lot of this romanistic fetishism it's fuck all the native religions of europe um we're just gonna fucking trash all over your fucking shit and like it's all about like christianity which also is native to europe but it's like, you know, I, I, you know, Irish paganism is also native to Europe. I don't think the Germans should should be like colonized by Irish paganism. <laughs> you know, goddamn. Uh, OK, well, I can't think of anything else that's happened in Canada over this past week. You know, Canada, you know, like doesn't do much. You know, nothing much changes here. It's all quiet and pacific. And uh, so a lot of refugees love to come here, but they're not allowed to come in anymore. So it's uh, it's I mean, of, Canada know, really. It's more like a veneer of pacificness with them because, like, yeah. the it, it depends on like where you are. Because once you get into the northern territories and you start getting to like uh, the the native regions, like that's where you start seeing like the Canadian Mountain Police not dressed like sheriffs from America and more dressed like fucking yeah. police uh sorry um fucking uh, military soldiers yeah uh, with like assault rifles yeah 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 well but, okay that's enough for canada uh, boring canada. i do have some stuff on yankistan um i mean that's actually technically um somewhat grammatically correct because stan just means land so like yes. I, I find it fucking hilarious like um and like you know, you catch the Americans off guard and you just go, oh, wow, well, we ain't going to stand. But the, um, what's it? Um, uh, the, the, the House of Representatives of the United States government. God, that sounded very official. I'm out of my waters. Um, uh, they uh, fucking just passed um, a bipartisan, whatever the fuck that's meant to mean in a country that basically has one parties that have the, like inter, interlope and interswap with each other. But the um, fucking um, uh, the um, a bill that is called the Child Internet Safety Act. This bill is to like restrict access to like um, things relating to like depression disorders um uh, certain types of social media um and other stuff like that um and uh it was worded in ways that would have like blocked people from like um discovering things like hrt being able to find out about gender dysphoria yeah. and stuff like that because of this perspective that it slammed forward hmm. and so like um what's it sounds it? like the uh, prohibition on sex education in schools public schools as well yeah it's um but like uh it's it's attacking on like stuff that people should be able to have access to like yeah. you know the kids aren't feeling suicidal because they went on the internet and googled the definition of depression 
or like found stuff on the internet around that stuff. The internet can be very dangerous. There definitely is like suicidal cultishness that can arouse from certain elements of like depressive, agitative circles. Fascists are known for pushing people over the edge like this. But those people target you. They come for you. You will not be protected by these pathetic barriers. What this mm. protects people from, supposedly, is from information that might actually save a life if someone is in a fucking drastic state of being. Information that could make you consider needing to go to the doctors and actually get some help because you have some serious fucking problems and difficulties. Information that could help you figure out that, yes, your feelings are correct. You are trans. It is justified. And you're okay to be that way. Information on getting DIY HR information on being able to like actually espouse yourself because anyone under the age of 16 is affected by this act so anything they want to learn about preparing their life again mm -hmm. like especially if you've got an abusive family that could take advantage of these kind of restrictions and put you under even larger lockdown than they already mm -hmm. can without them needing to be tech savvy to do it mm -hmm. so like because, I mean, the untech savvy way is to just confiscate stuff away from people, but that is too upfront. The social fascist parenting approach is to let you have those things and be restricted. What this kind of bill allows is for the normalization of that approach, because all you have to do is set up the phone to say, this is a like my child's phone, lock it down so they can't like change that at all. And then the, the internet is restricted for them. They won't be yes. able to research yes. anything and and, and, this and, is... and as well you know what's uh, important as well to say is that this forms a precedent so if they can impose you know censorship uh, on the uh, on on children less than 16 years of age then you know they can do so on anybody else you know make up some sort of a reason to do so andrew and come on like come approach yeah there's something i'd like to add to that because about three weeks ago I called the number 988 that was the suicide prevention number. And they treated my emotions like a game. Like I told them how lonely I was in the situation I was in. And they just told me that I called way too much and hung up on me. And I later mm. overdosed. Mm. Mm. So tell them that. Tell them what happened as a result of their lack of uh, sympathy. Yes. I will. And then, and and these kinds of things you write down as well. You know, you, you turn it into an affidavit. You know, so it becomes something that's uh, that can be used as a as a tool in legal procedure as well. Yeah. So a lot can be done. You know, and uh, basically, you know, all of this struggle and all this resistance. You know, this resistance culture. It's basically the principal reason, you know, for my life's work, you know, like I didn't start off in politics, you know, I was forced into politics because, you know, I was a refugee, basically, from fascism. And then even then, you know, what I wanted to study, you know, like was science and physics, you know, and, and mathematics, you know, and chemistry and lab and astronomy. That's what I wanted to do. You know, I didn't want to, you know, do politics because it was so frustrating. But, you know, you have to. It's a matter of, you know necessity it's a matter of obligation it's a matter of uh, duty even but uh do die. And also emotionally you know like you know i can't tolerate you know the way this world is you know working you know what's the point of you know going and <clears throat> studying physics you know if you end up like oppenheimer who is a jewish guy who thought he was going to save you know the world from from nazism by developing a bomb that could stop them in their tracks and instead it's not even used against the nazis Used against didn't that shit like Asian really fucking stuff. shake that guy up though didn't he like completely yeah. get rattled by all that he was he was not sensitive enough you know he was rattled but not enough not enough i haven't seen yeah, the film were... about his biography you know but i'm disappointed then there was oh, edward absolutely. Teller. So then there was edward teller who took his device and made him into something even more dangerous the hydrogen bomb. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then I found when I was studying uh, physics, you know, at the University of Waterloo, and somebody, you know, I was in the Vietnam anti-war movement, and and uh, the senator, uh, I forget his name now, he, he was pretty principled, you know, like he was against the nation state even. And he uh, asked for all of the information of U.S. military research projects everywhere. And it turned out, that US military was doing research at Canadian universities and it was doing research 
and giving subsidies to my professors at the University of Waterloo. So, you know, like I wrote up a big report about this and it was endorsed by the student government and published. And uh, after that, you know, I quit physics basically. In the fourth year, I went into uh, a transition year in social sciences. And then I got myself into graduate school without having to go, off, go through all the bullshit that they teach, you know, undergraduates about liberalism. So I had to, I had to do the, uh, you know, the political trip because there was no point in doing, you know, science, you know, because you were just playing into the military scheme of things, you know, because that's what's existed. So, you know, you couldn't, you know, you can't go into, you know, doing sciences, even though you love it, because, you know, you're going to be manipulated for sure, because that's where the money is. I uh, went into science in a different way. Uh, Revolutionary science. Ah, uh, okay. Revolutionary science, yes. Well, yeah, because I wanted to go into um, uh, nuclear physics um, so I could do, like, um, uh, nuclear power plant work. Yeah, See, me that too. That sounded like that was going to go down a dark path. No, it's actually cool work that's, like, really, really important. Yeah, yeah. I, I hear that China has just developed a, a nuclear reactor that when uh, when it uh, loses control, it just shuts down automatically. It's a th I think it's a thorium uh, reactor this time. I yeah, yeah, thorium reactors are pretty cool. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, Andrew? I wanted to go into computer science originally, uh, but I didn't get quite enough good grades, so I went in for uh, just residential maintenance at a uh, technical school. Uh, uh -huh. I got disappointed with um because I was studying physics, chemistry, and engineering because those are the things you're gonna need to go into nuclear engineering, yeah. and um I got displeased with it all, and so I switched lessons to um politics, sociology, and um uh, music theory, uh -huh. and then I took acid. And that turns <laughs> that into like such a life changing event because then while I was like decimated, like everywhere I was going felt like I'd never been there before, all the brickwork and stuff. Because I analyze buildings. If, if I've seen a building a hundred times, especially if it's an older building, I'm going to look at it again when I walk past it. I like to analyze my surroundings. I like to look at structures and how they interweave because I find buildings fascinating they are a marvel of engineering and they get so underrated because they're everywhere so like why would you care but they're marvels of engineering especially older buildings because they're actually properly constructed because they're not these cheaply designed fold them up constructions you can tell i'm a bit annoyed about modern construction <laughs> but um what's it um i was in a lesson just completely beaten down like the teacher was allowing me to listen to music because he understood the situation but he was like whenever i'm talking though rules are rules earphones out you've got to be listening which is great because it was also him ensuring that i was learning like uh because he knew i just couldn't do written tasks but he was like okay but when it's like an interaction like just try and be at least presently there if not try and get involved and it, then marxism came up and um we had to learn about like um what they call orthodox marxism which is actually not the original name for marxism orthodox marxism is actually the revisionist the angles criticized but uh, mm. um aside traditional marxism to use like a a, a more cr like a still cringe term but i guess better than orthodox um uh the the, the first wave uh we learn about that and mm. like I was shown this like Mario Marx video, which I haven't gone back to it, but I imagine it's like cringe compared to like where I am now, like watching that and be like, this seemed revelating to me is probably not going to seem so revelating anymore, but it blew me away. I was like, yo, cause I got caught up um, it, when I was really young. Like I'm talking like single digits. I got caught up in like Nazism. I was like eight, I think like, mm -hmm. um, and I got away from that when I learned about the Native American genocide because I was like, nah, racism, fuck that shit. And I got like, there's only so many like lynched people and like slaughters that you can read about and read direct experiences from and shit like that. Um, and get shown uh, like fucking like all these like really vivid films about slavery and be taught about it in a, in a lesson and just like come out of it. And like, you got to be a really fucked up person to come out of that and still be like, 
like uh, up for genocide or racism or things like that. So that shit changed my life. Then acid start, knocked me off from being like um, an enigma. I was like a fascist that didn't like racism that called themselves an anarchist. You do that maths. Um, but, you know, when I came to Marxism, because acid like fucking made me feel like I, I needed to start from like scratch. Like I just hated the way I was. And so I like, like, uh, without my, without my permission, my brain decided, boom, barrier, you got to start from scratch. You got to build up your perception around your experiences. Mm -hmm. I come across Marxism. I like, it was like, it, I, I cried. Like I found an actual scientific approach to socialism. Mm -hmm. Like motherfucker. Did I think I was a smart ass when I was a little kid? We've all been through that kind of experience to some degree. You kind of get a bit of a, like, I can think about concepts. So you get a little chip on your shoulder because society is kind of telling you and you get caught up in that sort of idea that like I thought that what I was believing was scientific, that like Nazism was from a scientific angle because you only get these history channel things that show you the marvels of engineering, of great creation and stuff. And to me, oh, that signals my science brain and goes, these people developed mm. industry scientific society and that instantly will start making you justify the pseudoscientific shit in your head about racism and other stuff like that and so it causes you to then be dry driven towards oppression even though one of the things that attracted me to them was that socialism tag that working class stuff because i didn't hear much about that kind of stuff what growing up as one of blair's forgotten youth yeah, no, there was like no representation of like the working class proper and certainly not of the, the, the lump and proletariat. And so like you end up getting caught in that situation where bigotry catches you on. So when I discovered Marxism, I was like, who the motherfucker was hiding this from me all my life? God damn. Um, and, uh, yes, you Andrew. Know, life yeah, well, I will admit that I went from like practically neoliberal to smoking weed anarchist reading come closer theory. come closer we want to hear about the weed <laughs> I, I, I apparently like, i went from neoliberal to smoking weed for the first time practically becoming an anarchist mm -hmm. and then turning mm -hmm. into a socialist essentially mm -hmm. well yeah. i mean what's it these things like um like anything that has like a hallucinogenic property like marijuana or as well it creates connections in your brain so like the like um it can actually like fucking um flag you up and switch you about uh, in ways that can really elevate you as a person. They can also fuck you around. Don't be one of those people that think I'm gonna take acid all the time because revelations as if they're a great thing to have. It's actually why I prefer marijuana because it's like it's subtle. It's not thrashing your head with time to break your entire reality completely. Knock knock knock. Did you want your brain to melt? It's more like. Time to think a little more from like a uh, more like conglomerate of and drawn back perspective where you're thinking of concepts in like the the like in a sensibility of how they actually form, function, and operate and engage with the natural world, rather than it being this like 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 with acid, it can be very individualized. I find marijuana isn't like that. I find marijuana is a lot more communalized in how it interacts with people because you're not blasted out into a state of dissociation. That's true. It's dissociated from other people. That's a problem. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Uh, well, what were you thinking? That. One thing Andrew? about LSD that turns people insane, especially when they take too much, that's uh -huh. exactly what happened to Sid Barrett from Pink Floyd. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. God damn, what is yeah. the uh, story about Pink Floyd, you know, because uh, um, um, what's his name, you know, now who's uh, parading as a, uh, a great champion? I don't see him in, you know, Pink Floyd videos, you know. Well, let's see. I mean, Roger, Roger Walters has been out of Pink Floyd since like, I think it was like 1989, I think he left. But he stayed around for like live shows for a bit. Uh -huh. So, but well, let's see, what... What was his instrument? You know, was he a guitarist or a bassist? Or no bassist, but he also played guitar on a lot of the tracks too. Like, okay, but he's not Pink Floyd. He's just. I mean, Roger Waters is what held Pink Floyd together. Like, I mean, it gets overblown oh. sometimes, like, and underrates the the other artists. But Roger oh. Waters was like, like when he went, Pink Floyd essentially ceased to exist. 
I mean, I mean, when Sid Barrett went, Pink Floyd already took a big hit. Like, Roger himself said this. Like, when Sid went, it wasn't the same. Like, and it, it, that's the kind of core thing is Sid was a tragedy because Sid, when he wasn't a fucking pisshead and, like, a, a wreckage and a chaotic fucking mess, mm-hmm. like, he was a fucking lovely guy. But once he touched and smashed that booze, he was a Dave Mustaine. Like, that motherfucker would fucking wreak havoc on the mm. environment around him. And, mm. like, it, that was just why they, they, they sent him away. And that's, uh, that's uh, the song Wish You Were Here. It's actually mm. about them having them not there to play with them. He was actually still alive when they recorded that song. It's not about him dying. Um, the, that's a the, mis, misconception. You know Come closer, know, and, was... Andrew. Come closer to your mic. I don't know if you know the song from The Wall. Nobody home, but when he talks about I got pinholes in front, all in front of my shirt. He was talking about Sid Barrett and how they asked that Hendrix firm too. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Anyway, you know this Roger Walters. You know he's stepped into a big, big swimming pool and he doesn't know how to swim very well. You know he sort of you know says you know cliches and slogans and that sort of thing. You know, but. You got to mm-hmm. think he's he like whole he's thing was like he um a, he comes from like working class, like opposition of fascism from the 70s and like the 60s. And that like got highly fixated on Thatcherism, which wow. like is neoliberalism. It's not neoliberalism has fascist tendencies. But like if we just start quantifying everything as just fascists, then like we won't be able to determine the differences between concepts like yeah. neoliberalism is an attempt at doing liberalism. It just fails at it and mm-hmm. d- delves too much into a lot of its fascistic elements. But mm-hmm. there's there's a difference. Fascistic elements is not the same as being fascism in the case of bourgeois society because fascism has liberal elements. You're going to call fascism liberalism? Once you start confusing mm-hmm. concepts like that, you will never mm-hmm. know the difference between these people because there are differences they will collaborate with each other, but that does not make them the same thing. It's the same with, like, um, you know, a lot of other concepts, you know. Yeah, Social so fascism and fascism are actually almost like, like you know, they're, they're twins. They uh-huh. are, in essence, the same thing, but they are also very different from each other. Okay, like, Andrew, if you come, get into this thing where you mic. don't... Okay, if you come, come into this... To- you're repeating yourself. Okay, we know that. Okay, now, Andrew, I'm tr- you have to come I'm back. trying come to clarify mic. concepts. Yes. I, so, like, fuck. So with social fascism and fascism, they have a lot of different representations of how they conglomerate their institution of this control. But in essence, the functions of what they attempt to achieve are the same. Liberalism and fascism don't necessarily have the same wants or achievements other than the uh, continuation and perpetuation of bourgeois society. The way they want to organize bourgeois society is drastically different from each other. And so I think people need to be a little more considerate of like how we define concepts so that we can actually get to the position of combating rising mm-hmm. fascism and actually dealing with the fact that Nazism is like back on the map right now. Yes, I could add in, in terms of methodology, we have to use concepts such as tendency and dynamics. You know, uh, d- uh, you know, conflicting uh, political doctrines can have shared tendencies of thought as there are between neoliberalism and fascism and dynamics are historical sort of events that take place on a mass scale that are um, stronger than tendencies and stronger than existing structures and events and you know one can talk about you know the 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 logical consequence of certain dynamics you know which can allow you to analyze and predict actually in a prescient prescient manner you know what one expects to happen so these are concepts that are not usually used in analysis, you know, but we should begin to adopt, you know, more sort of uh, elaborate, you know, methodology with which to analyze things. Okay. Andrew, so we can point out my... these peculiarities, yes. especially. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. You have to approach the microphone, Andrew. I will say in some of Pink Floyd's music, including most of Roger Waters' songs from the wall, including in the flesh and waiting for the worms. He does 
pretty accurately describe the concept of classism. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay, I, I would say that there's limitations. There's limitations to his definition of fascism, but the way he represents, um, like this Mosleyist like way, and the rise of fascism is very accurate. Like mm -hmm. on its philosophy, I wouldn't necessarily go for Roger for that, but on its actual rise and its functions and stuff like that, the guy is actually rather smart when it comes to stuff like that. The way he envisioned this rise of the of the ideologue and stuff like that, it definitely fits to Nazism. And the way um, uh, the 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 left in quotation marks of Nazism, the Strasserists, the Mosleyites, and um, all them lot, how they poised fascism, and I mean how people like Goebbels continue to use those poignations from Strasserism to keep Nazism looking. Um, you know, quasi socialist enough to keep its oh, yeah, uh, yeah. throughout the world. That's 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 what I was sort of you know like uh, if picking up you know from Roger Walters you know like it's a populist you know leader cult that he proposes uh, uh, that he purports to be you know this is you know what I think but you know he does it sort of you know in a naive kind of a way it's not in sort of intentional you know it's sort of the thing to do you know like it's that's a what problem it of like being a rock star. Yeah, like, he's kind of tried to subvert it a lot and tried to ground people that he's just down to earth and he's about real shit. But people mm -hmm. always, it's like it's Roger Walters, and I'm mm -hmm. like, I don't know. Like, I know these guys come from like fucking bread. Like, I would like to just sit down and chat with the guy. I hate this like infantilization of like musicians and all that. And you get David Gilmour and all that. Like, David Gilmour's the complete opposite to Roger Walters. He plays straight up into the demagoguery. <laughs> What's that, Andrew? Come come to the mic. David Gilmore about two years ago has released a song released by a banderite. Oh. Uh-huh. Like it was a cover song or he, he It was a cover song, yes. Uh-huh. Okay. Oh my, okay. Whew. Pop culture. Pop culture is not necessarily progressive or socialist you know pop culture can be can be uh you know the nazis had a form of pop culture as well anyway it's all sort of you know messy okay so good we've had a session dis discussing uh political culture that's usually not a topic that's discussed you know and and uh, it's an important point of uh, interaction because like i feel like a lot of people take this more stone cold approach to politics yeah, that's where they get their politics from, you know, pop culture, you know, you know, gives people such a sex education, political consciousness and uh, an emotional release. You know, like pop culture is, you know, has more influence on the generations than even the school system does. It's incredible. Yeah, okay. um, both for better and for worse. You see good elements and bad elements arise out of this, depending on which types of pop culture it is to reach out to people. But yeah. I guess it's like, um, you know, like counterculture is really like what our pop culture is because we're trying to build proletarian cultural hegemony. So we're not really yeah. like, we're not about like um, being uh, like a conglomerative of the petty bourgeois spaces. We want to move into those, like all these spaces to take over them. Like we don't want to become a part of this fucking like sellout community. We want to decimate like that kind of perspective on music and bring yeah. things forward. To, yeah, we want like, to replace. We want. We have a new culture that we want to replace the old, you know, stereotypes and cliches with. I can't stand cliches. I even had one roommate, you know, that only talked in cliches, and eventually I had to ask him to leave. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> it was just too much to take. It was like torture. <laughs> okay. So, uh, okay, we've done something new and different here. I hope this is going to be appreciated. And, you know, we have to say that you know the viewers you know, have to take this, you know, as something that is of value for the general sort of, you know, political culture to know about. And so we ask you to share, share the video, share and promote. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. And we will be back to harass you some more next week. Okay. I will say that I don't have many subscribers on YouTube. So I'll share this on to Facebook. Yeah. Facebook, you know, I have, that's where I do most of the, uh, <laughs> my work i mean i have you know old email lists you know but they are of the older generation of people and they're so limited you know these are people who in a crisis will turn into 
who knows what. So it's very limited. But but then there are breakthroughs as well. Breakthrough is what we're going for. And the tendencies uh, that you refer to, the elements that you mentioned, Kara, I would use the term, that's what I mean by tendencies. What you refer to as elements, you know, in a given sort of, you know, train of thought. Yeah. The tendencies, you know, are the ones, you know, that we have to become aware of, distinguish in and of themselves and not, uh, you know, consider that they are the whole of the of the body that is uh, that is purporting, purporting them. Falsification like, uh, is like a really big yeah. problem with a lot of people in the imperial core. They kind of just try and like treat things as like equals because they're all bad. And it's like, that's just not how like dialectics works. So these people all want to go on about how they're big dialectical materialists. So it's like, mm -hmm. you got to like really quantify the relationship between things. You can't just make these false equivocations. Yeah, you have and, to have an and overgeneralizations. An overgeneralization is most typically always wrong. Like, yes. you know, like racism. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I think we've done our job for this week and we can stop recording now. And the convergence uh, welcomes you and asks you to share it. That's basically, you know, like we can conclude with. Okay. Bye for now, everyone.